rates. Another spike in the number of cases as the highly transmissible and immune evasive BA5 subvariant rapidly spreads across the country. Once again, the number of hospitalizations and deaths are rising. But it's not exactly the summer of the subvariant as much of the public has returned to life as normal, collectively throwing caution to the breeze. But as breakthrough infections surge and the threat of post-COVID remains, are we meeting this moment in the pandemic with an appropriate response? And if not, what ramifications might we face? Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight, as always, our resident, world-renowned doctor, Jeffrey Gold, the chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And we have a very special guest tonight, infectious disease expert, Dr. Mark Rupp will join our conversation, and you are a big part of this show. In just a little bit, we're going to open up our phone lines to your questions and comments, and we'd love to hear from you tonight. I want to give you the number. It's 877-731-6733, and we will go to the phones in just a moment. But first, Dr. Gold, let's start with a look at how things have changed over just the last week around the globe and here at home. Well, thank you, and uh, a warm welcome to our audience this evening. And before we get started, just a comment that our thoughts and prayers are with all those who are infected by the fires that are spreading through the western part of our country, and particularly those that are sacrificing so much to fight those fires and to protect those homesteads uh, in this nation. So let's get right into the data, as we always do when we start the show, and start off with the trends uh, globally. And as you can see, uh, Western Europe, uh, parts of the Far East in Japan, uh, in uh, Australia, New Zealand, larger parts now of South America are deeply colored red and purple uh, and orange. Uh, and uh, indeed, we're now starting to see uh, other areas, uh, in, particularly uh, in the Central European area, in the Eastern European area, uh, equally starting to show changes of more spread. And the numbers, of course, uh, support that. If you look at the total number of reported cases worldwide, and again, this is data that's uh, always lagging and it's data that underestimates it. We're looking at just over 1.1 million confirmed cases in the last 24 hours. That's a 14-day running average increase of 23 uh, percent. That is significantly up. But even deaths, uh, 2.2 thousand deaths confirmed worldwide, Again, a significant underestimate, bringing the total numbers uh, up to approximately uh, 6.3, 6.4 million confirmed deaths due to COVID since the beginning of the pandemic. And again, up 40 percent over the last 14 days, uh, largely due to the BA5 uh, subtype of Omicron that we've been seeing. Now, when we shift our focus to our nation, uh, including uh, Alaska, Hawaii, the, the uh, central parts of the United States, you can see that there's almost no part of the country that's not seeing a significant uptick uh, in the number of cases. Nowhere near as much as uh, we're seeing uh, in the southern parts of the country, or the far west, the southwest, and once more again, uh, parts of Alaska and what we'll see in a minute, largely due uh, to the BA5 subtype. Uh, this week, it looks like the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast are slightly less involved. Uh, the upper and central reaches of Michigan are slightly less involved. But look at what's going on in Louisiana, South Texas, California, Arizona, and of course, uh, Florida, Alaska, etc. Uh, when we look at the numbers, uh, you see a total of about 127,000 reported cases in the last day. This is data as of last midnight. 19 percent up. And again, this is a significant underestimate because of the amount of home testing with rapid tests and also people that just aren't getting tested. But hospitalization, which is a far better number, 43,000 Americans are hospitalized, up 15 percent in the last two weeks. About 15 percent of those or 14 percent of those are in intensive care. But if you look at the death rate, the death rate's up to 444 in the last 24 hours. Again, that's a 38 percent increase uh, running average in the last 14 days, significantly up. And again, uh, this is largely driven by the volume of the BA5 subtype. When we start to look 
uh, at the trends in the graphic form. You can see, uh, while we're nowhere near as high as we were uh, in uh, February uh, and early March due to the uh, BA1 subtype of Omicron, uh, we are in a continued rise and moving beyond the plateau stage, uh, which is giving us all a bit of concern. When you break it down by states, you see that U.S. average is now 39 cases per 100,000 per day. When we were together just a week ago, we were about 34, 35 cases per 100,000 per day. So that's up about 10 or 15 percent just in the last week uh, since we spoke. But Alaska, approximately twice that. Louisiana, California, Alabama, and Florida, just as the map shows, higher than the U.S. average in terms of the rate of growth. But when we look at the smaller communities, particularly some of the small farming and ranching communities, again, compared to a U.S. average of 39 per 100,000, look at Hardin, Texas, uh, Goshen, uh, West Virginia, or Wyoming, rather, uh, Imperial, California, Jasper, Texas, etc. Very significant high rates, small numbers of cases, but again, just reinforcing the fact uh, that these are diseases that affect both the large urban areas and the small rural farming and ranching communities of our nation uh, as well. If we look at the current wastewater levels, again, this was refreshed as recently as midnight last night. What you can see is the only category that continues to grow is the 80 to 100 percent category, which is up another 6 percent out of the just over 1,000 areas in the nation that are reporting wastewater levels of coronavirus. And again, these wastewater levels have been extremely predictive of cases, hospitalization, and tragically uh, of death rates uh, as well. When we look at the subtypes, uh, again, uh, you know, it's, it is the BA5 subtype. You know, we heard uh, from the White House just recently that it was very likely that it is the BA5 subtype that has uh, infected the president. Uh, that is now about 75 percent of the uh, infections uh, with Omicron that are occurring uh, here uh, in the United States today. And this is likely going to continue to rise as it seems to be in a stepwise fashion over the last uh, several weeks. If you look at the distribution across the United States, again, it marries up to approximately 75 percent, a little more than that in, in the Pacific Northwest and in the Southwest, approximately 75 percent in the Northeast and in the Mid-Atlantic, and a bit of variability uh, in uh, Region 6 in Texas and uh, and in the southeast. But again, predominantly uh, and, and continually uh, BA5 subtype of the Omicron uh, variant. Or again, just to remind our audience that the BA5 subtype is extremely communicable. You know, as had been said by several, that even a quick elevator ride with somebody who's infected and not protected with a mask or other facial protection could be enough uh, to get infected uh, with the BA5 subtype, largely explaining why we're seeing vaccine breakthrough, why we're seeing reinfection, and why we're seeing growth of this uh, vaccine uh, variant type. You know, when we start to look at uh, hospitalization and critical care rates, uh, you don't need to be a research scientist to see that the hospitalization rate continues to rise. Again, it's not going up as fast as it did uh, with the Omicron BA1 subtype, but it is still going up. And unfortunately, intensive care unit stays are also going up, and there's no evidence that this is starting to plateau, driven largely by number of cases and volumes. U.S. average, 13 Americans hospitalized at just over 43,000, 13 per 100,000 in the U.S. But as you can see, that Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, is almost three times that. Uh, Delaware, West Virginia, uh, Florida and Missouri are one and a half to two times that number. So again, it, it shows that there's still an uneven distribution of hospitalization uh, and critical care use uh, in the United States. And if you were to look at some of the smaller critical access hospitals and the impact there, uh, you'd see even more variability, again, uh, underscoring the importance of it. U.S. map shows a number of hot spots, but again, a significant amount of hospitalization and rising, uh, even seen in our community here. 
And when we shift to the tragic loss of life and the deaths, uh, although it's nowhere near as high as it was with the Delta wave or with the peak of the Omicron BA1 wave, we never got down to baseline and was now over 440 deaths per day in the United States. It wasn't that long ago, Christina, that we were in the high 200s, uh, and not that every single death doesn't count as its tragic uh, loss of life. But again, these curves are slowly but surely creeping upward. And that's in spite of vaccines, in spite of the good antiviral uh, meds that we now have. So in the U.S., uh, our average currently is about 0.13. We were less than 0.1 a few weeks ago. Uh, but New Mexico at 0.92, Oregon, Mississippi, Florida, Alaska, you know, well over uh, one and a half to as much as four or five times uh, the U.S. Uh, average uh, number of deaths uh, per day. Now, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about the vaccines. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of misinformation that's been circulated, and I particularly like uh, to talk about the prevention of reinfection, the prevention of the need to go to an emergency room and the need to be hospitalized specifically. So 32 percent boosted. And if you look at the map of the U.S., you see that certain parts are more boosted than others. Uh, the darker colors indicate the higher boost rates. Uh, but overall, as a nation, we are approximately half or even slightly less than half most of the rest of the G20, certainly most of the rest of Western Europe, uh, uh, certain parts of South America, uh, et cetera, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but, you know, this is a kind of a busy graphic, but I want to point out a couple of things. This was a recently released study that looked at total COVID infection rates from December of 2021, so last Christmas approximately, through the end of June of this year, so a month ago approximately, for 10 states in the United States. So these are huge samples of hundreds of thousands of individuals uh, in the United States. And if you look at where the arrows are uh, on the far edge of the screen, uh, my right side of the screen as I look at it, what you see in all age groups for people that were immunized with three doses of vaccine between a week, seven days ago, and 119 days, there's a 56 percent prevention of needing urgent care or going to the emergency room. More than 120 days, 26 percent. But if you drop down to the lower corner of your screen, seen in the amber arrow there, you can see for those individuals that are over 50 years of age and those individuals that got a second boost or a fourth dose, uh, those individuals have approximately a 66 percent chance of not needing to go to an emergency room or an urgent care center. And when we look at the impact of this same data on hospitalization, you can see for those that are over 50 and those that got two booster doses, there's an 80 percent chance of preventing hospitalization. It just makes the point that for anything and everything that we can do, short of social distancing, masking, and the other non-pharmacologic interventions, and even with all of the vaccine breakthrough due to BA5 and the other subtypes, we are still seeing a very significant and 80 percent chance of preventing serious illness to the point of preventing hospitalization in those over 50, which of course are those that are most vulnerable. So vaccines matter. The booster doses matter as well. And not only that, they matter considerably in post-COVID. You know, in one of our previous shows, we spent a lot of time looking at long COVID or the post-COVID syndrome. And what this graphic says, uh, us utilizing very good data uh, from large, large numbers of individuals in the United States, that for those that are triple vaxxed, uh, that there's a significant percentage of long COVID for Delta, BA1 and BA2, and even a more significant rate of reducing severe post-COVID syndromes, those that would limit your ability to go to work, go to school, perhaps require urgent care or hospitalization. <clears throat> and even if you go to those that are double vaccinated, <clears throat> excuse me, those that did not receive uh, any boosts, there's still a significant prevention, uh, even with the uh, BA subtypes of Omicron of post-COVID. 
And so with that, let's just shift gears uh, just for a few minutes and talk about one or two other highly relevant topics. The first one here is the World Health Organization uh, announcement about monkeypox now reaching the level of a global health emergency. Again, if we look at the world map, <clears throat> United States, Central America, South America, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, uh, certainly uh, parts of Africa, which is more endemic for monkeypox, over 16,000 confirmed cases, uh, over 74 countries now reporting an outbreak of this uh, pox virus disease. Uh, Spain has the most cases been reported, just over 3,100. U.S. at 2,890 uh, is the second largest rate of spread in the United States uh, and around the world. Hard to believe that we've escalated to that. If you look at the U.S. map, you can see there are just a handful of cases of states that are not reporting cases currently, including our state here, which recently reported a total of five confirmed cases, many more under evaluation as we speak. The state of New York still has the most. California, uh, second, uh, 356 confirmed cases, followed by Florida, Illinois, Georgia, District of Columbia. And, you know, early on, uh, this was almost uh, thought to be a disease uh, associated almost purely with men having sex with men. However, we're now seeing women and we're seeing children uh, being infected with monkeypox. And as we had discussed on this show previously, it's just a matter of time before our youngest and oldest populations start to see the spread of this. And again, uh, underscoring the need for when appropriate vaccination, early testing and treatment uh, with very, very good antivirals uh, when they become uh, available. And then finally, just a few minutes about this uh, incredibly extreme heat wave that we've been seeing across the U.S. Uh, certainly, I am not a meteorologist and I don't predict the weather, but these are maps looking at caution extreme caution, danger, and extreme dangerous conditions related to heat for today, July 25th, up through uh, next uh, weekend. And what you can see, there are significant parts of the country uh, in the south central part, the southeast, uh, and in the southwest part of the country that are each danger or extreme danger uh, due to heat. And the point that I really wanted to make for our, particularly for our farming and ranching communities tonight is the difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke. So heat exhaustion is a combination of fainting and dizziness, excessive sweating, uh, cool, pale skin, potentially some nausea or vomiting, a rapid weak pulse, and muscle cramps. Heat stroke is quite different. That is a throbbing, unrelenting headache, no body sweating, a body temperature defining above 103 degrees, with red hot dry skin, uh, nausea, vomiting, uh, and potentially even loss of consciousness. Heat stroke, call 911. Get the person into a cooler environment, uh, protect them from falling and losing consciousness, but call emergency help as quickly as you can get. Heat exhaustion, very different. Move the individual to a cooler location, drink plenty of water, use of cold compresses or a cold shower, uh, is a good thing to do. So with that, let's uh, go to our audience. I very much look forward to your questions this evening. And in just a few minutes, we'll have the opportunity to introduce one of the world experts in these infectious diseases, uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. Mark Rupp. And I love the way that Dr. Mark Rupp is able to explain things to us in a way that we can understand them easily. So we look forward to bringing him in on the conversation. I'm so glad that you brought up those heat warnings for us, Dr. Gold. It's so important because, as you probably know, farmers and ranchers, they're task-oriented, so they'll keep pushing themselves until that task that they're working on is complete. So that's a really good reminder, especially because we could be talking about the hottest summer on record in Texas before all is said and done. All right, let's go back to COVID because... It seems like everybody knows somebody right now who's dealing with COVID. There are a multitude of reports tonight about high-profile people getting COVID just over the last few days. Sure. President Joe Biden, Senator Joe Manchin. And I read earlier today, Dr. Gold, that in California, outbreaks are hitting TSA as well as workers for Southwest and American Airlines. Now, since case numbers are rising, predominantly driven by the spread of BA5, if someone does contract COVID, 
What is the current guidance? Maybe there's specific guidance for BA5 when it comes to the amount of isolation time that we need. When do you know when it's okay to return to the public? Well, certainly the most important thing, Christina, is that individuals who are symptomatic or have a high risk exposure need to get tested. They either need to get rapid tested with a home test or they need to get PCR tested, uh, saliva tested or swabbed or something of that nature because we have really, really an highly effective oral agents such as Paxlovid and, and to some extent uh, availability of monopiravir. Uh, which are really, really good. We also have very good intravenous agents that are effective against BA5. So the single most important thing return, uh, in terms of returning to your health and ultimately returning to work or returning to school or whatever is to get early treatment. Now, having said that, uh, the current recommendations, and Dr. Rupp may want to weigh in on this when we introduce him in the next segment, uh, is a minimum of five days uh, after symptomatic uh, improvement. Now, different people have different approaches. Another possibility is to be tested and retested uh, until those tests are negative. But one of the things that we've seen is sometimes these people will have positive tests for long, long periods of time, even though they're not symptomatic and they are, have levels of virus that are so low that they can't transmit it to others. And for those reasons, we are recommending uh, return to work, return to school, return to social engagements with the mask at approximately 10 days uh, or, or less, possibly even five days after symptomatic status. Uh, but again, it's going to vary a lot by individual to individual. You know, if you're still coughing and sneezing, if you still have a low-grade temp, if you still don't feel yourself, uh, you don't want to risk your health and you certainly don't want to risk the health of others. Absolutely. Okay, I just thought it would be a good reminder of what we need to do with everything that we've learned so far about the virus. Let's switch gears to monkeypox. Like you said, it's now a global health emergency, according to the World Health Organization. Now, you mentioned on a previous show that if we were to see an outbreak in an extended living facility or a daycare, then we would likely be talking more and more about vaccines. But that just seems so reactive. Is there anything that we can do right now to be proactive, knowing that this threat is spreading? Well, you know, as the White House recently announced, uh, they have shipped and will continue to ship hundreds of thousands of doses of vaccine. The good news is we don't have to develop new vaccines uh, for this orthopox virus. We have a number that exist. We have stockpiles of these vaccines that were prepared for smallpox and are uh, efficacious uh, uh, for uh, monkeypox as well. The name of the game is going to be to be, as you say, Christina, proactive, certainly those people uh, that are at high risk. You know, the concerns that we have is that one is that we're under counting, we're under testing people because uh, they may have either a very limited rash or they may prefer not to come forward. Or perhaps they just have the, uh, you know, sinus congestion, fever, cough and uh, fatigue that is the prodrome of the syndrome before they actually develop the characteristic rash. And for all those reasons, we may be underestimating it. And uh, secondly, uh, unfortunately, uh, there may be uh, a number of individuals who are actually infected who may choose just not to uh, come forward at this time. And so uh, th this is uh, of concern because our very youngest and our very oldest, particularly those in long-term care facilities, those with multiple medical comorbidities, which are going to be very much like what we've seen with COVID, with the flu, with so many other diseases, you know, older age, uh, <clears throat> diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, chronic obstructive lung disease, certain types of medication uh, that uh, blunt your ability to have an active immune response. All of those things together are going to define the higher risk groups. And, you know, sadly, if we start to see spread in those communities, uh, the likelihood is we're going to start to see some case fatalities associated with it. You know, here's hoping not because we have good vaccines and good treatment. But again, uh, forewarned and is forearmed and being proactive is going to be the name of the game here. Uh, that's why we so appreciate you. You help us to be proactive. And there's so many things that we have to navigate through this day and age 
to just stay healthy. We are going to invite you into the conversation. Now, we want to hear from you tonight. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. We appreciate you hanging on the line, Marianne from Georgia. Go right ahead. Marianne? Yes. Hi. Um, yes. Yes. I wanted to um, ask him, Dr. Gold, if my husband and I, back June the 14th, through about a week with mild COVID, if that possibly was uh, BA5 in Georgia. I would say more than possibly, Marianne, I would say likely uh, it was either BA5 or certainly uh, BA4. By that time, uh, between the BA4, BA5 combination, we were at about 70, 80 percent of the new cases uh, in the United States. So the good news is that it was a mild case, and the good news is that you're going to have some immunity due to being actively infected. The bad news is, based upon some of the data that we've previously shared, that's probably going to last at most uh, 60 days, maybe 75 days at most. And so when the next round of boosters become available for these new generation Omicron-specific uh, boosts that hopefully both Moderna, Pfizer, and Novavax will come forward with, that would be a good time for you and your husband to roll up your sleeve. Hopefully it'll be at the same time you get your flu shot. We love, though, that you've made this a family viewing experience, as many have, Dr. Gold. So thank you so much for being our first caller tonight, Marianne from Georgia. All right, we're going to pause for a quick break. When we come back, Joe from Mississippi, I know you've been hanging on the line. We will get to your question, and we want to hear from you tonight as well. Our phone lines are open, 877-731-6733. This is such a rare show because any question that you have about COVID-19, about monkeypox, even about heat stroke now, you can call in and get some immediate answers. We'll be right back with more Rural Health Matters after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We're glad you're with us. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome a familiar face, our special guest, Dr. Mark Rupp. Now, Dr. Rupp has been on the front lines in the fight against Ebola and now against COVID-19. He and his team treated some of the very first Americans to contract COVID-19. He is the chief of infectious diseases medicine and the medical director of infection control and epidemiology at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. He has quite a resume. He's a very important man. He's spending some time with us. We appreciate you, Dr. Rupp. Welcome back. Many of us were hoping that at this point we'd be using that word endemic by now, but we're still talking about pandemic. Uh, what are the guidelines? Is this something that you think will even change? Well, you know, I think we're seeing the evolution of the pandemic uh, as it goes through its phases. I think most folks would agree that we're not in the acute phase of the pandemic anymore. And all of us are grappling of, of how we move forward and how we learn to live with this disease that uh, is going to stay with us um, for the foreseeable future. Wow. With the exception of some very careful individuals who may have serious health concerns in their families, it seems like most of us are not taking as many precautions, if any, these days. What do you think will be the result of this in the coming months when you factor in what we're seeing with BA5 right now? Well, as Dr. Gold mentioned in the preamble to the show, the BA5 is incredibly contagious. It spreads very, very easily from person to person. And I do think that we have become a little bit too complacent, a little bit too lackadaisical about the threat that's posed by uh, the BA5 as well as the other subvariants and what may be coming down the pike. So I think that people who aren't uh, fully vaccinated and boosted, uh, folks who are at higher risk of having more severe disease, really should continue to take some precautions to be prudent, uh, to avoid high risk settings, to wear a mask when they can't be avoided. Uh, many of these things are relatively easy to incorporate uh, into your lifestyle and they can help to make you safer. You know, you have committed your life, dedicated your life to learning as much about infectious diseases as possible. My question is, has there been a disease or pandemic like this in history where you can get infected over and over again 
And perhaps herd immunity is not possible. Previous pandemics eventually died out or with the help of medical and scientific intervention, they slowly petered out. What are you expecting from this one? Well, I think that clearly, you know, our increasing population immunity is helping us, whether it be through disease-induced immunity or through the vaccine. Uh, clearly, we're not seeing as many people end up severely ill in the hospital or dying. Uh, again, as was shown by the, the data that Dr. Gold presented at the beginning of the program. Um, you know, this really is an unprecedented uh, uh, disease that we have the ability and the opportunity to study in detail and learn a lot more about how pandemics evolve. Uh, each pandemic, each virus, each infectious diseases is somewhat unique. Uh, we really can only claim eradication of one disease, and that would be smallpox. Uh, all the other diseases continue to circulate uh, within the human population. And uh, we'll continue to see uh, this disease uh, circulate amongst humans for some time to come. Wow. Okay. We are going to come back to you in just a moment. We want to go back to the phones now. Joe of Mississippi, as promised, go right ahead with your question. I'm 83 years old. I've enjoyed good health over the years. Two weeks ago, I was diagnosed with Aceville. My question for Dr. Gold is, could the uh, COVID vax and boosters cause this problem? Well, first of all, thanks for calling, Joe. And uh, I'm sorry to hear about your diagnosis of AFib. However, uh, the good news is this is very good treatment and prevention medications uh, for that as well. Uh, you know that the question of causation there's just to turn it 180 degrees just for a question. What I am sure is that people that have heart disease, whether it's weakness of their heart muscle or irregularity of their heart muscle because AFib somewhat reduces the efficiency of your heart, you know, speaking as a recovering cardiac doctor, I have a lot of experience in that area, does weaken your stamina, reduces your exercise tolerance, and reduces your ability uh, to sustain other illnesses. There's also no question that there's a good number of people who are actively infected with COVID who developed cardiac problems, including congestive heart failure, including AFib and others. But cause and effect due to the vaccines, I'm not aware of that, but you know, see if Dr. Rupp knows something about that. Dr. Gold, uh, absolutely correct, spot on. Uh, pretty much every cardiac complication that is known is much, much more prevalent amongst natural disease than it is uh, associated with the vaccine. Obviously, when you give the vaccine to hundreds of millions of people, there are going to be uh, incidental and coincidental occurrences of illness that really, as you mentioned, don't have a causation associated with the vaccine. What we do know is that the vaccine is very protective, uh, as you pointed out, continues to protect against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. And uh, that's really people's best bet in trying to prevent the more, severious ram more serious ramifications of uh, COVID-19. All right. Thank you so much for that call. We're going to go to New York. Carl joins the conversation. Now, thanks for joining us, Carl. Go right ahead. Okay. My question is, are the at-home tests uh, still detecting the new variants? And um, how soon would I be able to get a Novavax booster? I've been fully vaxxed and boosted with uh, Moderna so far. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I'll answer the second part of your question. I will let Dr. Rupp uh, deal with the first. Uh, so the Novavax product uh, is approved uh, for use as a primary vaccine sequence. It's a two-dose sequence of this pure protein construct vaccine. Right now, there is not emergency use authorization uh, as a boost. However, the Food and Drug Administration uh, and the ACIP are likely going to address this in the near future. And uh, just in reading the uh, literature, uh, it sounds like that Novavax, just like uh, Pfizer and Moderna, are also working on uh, Omicron-specific vaccine boosts as well, which hopefully will be available late summer, uh, early spring. Uh, Dr. Rupp, uh, thoughts on that and thoughts on uh, our caller's first question? 
Well, we look forward to continued improvements in the vaccine, that's for sure. And there is talk that this fall we'll have a dual vaccine available that will target the uh, uh, older strain of uh, COVID as well as the Omicron-specific uh, variants. Uh, with regard to Carl's first question, the antigen tests do detect these uh, variants and subvariants. They are directed towards a, a universal uh, target for detecting that virus, but they are less sensitive uh, than the PCR assays. And we've really known that since uh, very, very early in the pandemic and when these first tests uh, were first introduced. So uh, you can get fooled a little bit. They aren't quite as sensitive, particularly in the early stages of illness, uh, but they are useful and they will detect uh, all the strains of COVID. All right. Thank you so much for that question, Carl. Next, we're going to Kentucky. Donald joins us from the Bluegrass State. Go right ahead, Donald. Thank you. Dr. Gold, did I understand you to say that we were using the vaccine from smallpox or the monkeypox? Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, so uh, smallpox and monkeypox are both part of a classification of viruses called orthopox viruses. And there's a good deal of cross-reactivity uh, between uh, both of those viruses in terms of what their surfaces look like. And therefore, the vaccines that were developed uh, specifically for uh, smallpox, and there are two of them, one that's a more traditional vaccine, and then there's a newer vaccine that's been manufactured and is being expanded in scope and scale uh, for shipment right now across the United States. And that's what uh, the White House has been talking about. But yeah, uh, that is my understanding. Uh, and so because of that, Donald, uh, individuals that were vaccinated against smallpox, you know, in their childhood, because uh, we stopped vaccinating routinely in the early 70s in the United States, should have some degree of immunity. You know, I wonder, I might ask Dr. Rupp, if we have any idea as to what the, how effective that early immunity uh, from a childhood vaccine uh, from smallpox might be for the, the current monkeypox uh, that we're seeing. I mean, I haven't seen any science on that, but I'm wondering if whether you have, Dr. Rupp. Well, as, as you mentioned, there is cross-reactivity between smallpox and monkeypox. They're both very closely related. Uh, we do think that the smallpox vaccine that people got uh, decades ago may offer some continued protection against monkeypox. But again, everybody received that vaccine uh, decades ago. Uh, we're not sure how uh, robust that response will be. And so I don't think that people want to rely upon that necessarily uh, to again uh, go out and uh, perhaps contract uh, monkeypox. Uh, folks need to be aware that this is uh, spreading uh, throughout the country. Uh, it's largely in certain demographics at the present time, uh, mostly men who have sex with men or have uh, multiple sex partners. Um, you know, it probably won't stay in that population for uh, a long period. It's going to spill over into other groups uh, because it is behaving very much like a sexually transmitted disease. Um, but uh, again, to get back to your question, we do think that the old smallpox vaccine probably does offer some protection, but luckily we have a better vaccine now, one that is uh, safer and we think is highly effective. Uh, that vaccine is being brought uh, as quickly as possible out and distributed and uh, will be targeting those people who are at uh, higher risk. All right. Thank you for that call. We're going to Colorado to hear from Laverne next. Thanks for joining us, Laverne. Go right ahead. Yes, I uh, have been, uh, you know, vaccinated and boosted and um, I wound up getting COVID and I uh, it was over Fourth of July weekend. And so I called the doctor and it was the doctor on duty that I told. And so he sent out the uh, Paxoid to me and said that I should cut out of my blood thinning uh, of medicine for five days plus another three. Well, as a result, which I did, as a result, I wound up in the hospital with uh, blood clots in my arm and um, and and mm. little, I guess you call them ticks, little minor uh, strokes on them, which they said that wouldn't bother me except that I has been much more vulnerable to um, uh, big strokes. And um, and so 
that's where, in fact, I was in the hospital and just got out a couple of days ago. I was in for six days uh, here in Colorado. Uh, is that the, uh, is that what they usually say to cut out your blood thinning uh, medicine? Or was that, they said a lot of people could stand it, but I couldn't. I'm 89. What is your Well, Laverne, idea first of all, thank you so Thank you so much for calling, and I'm so sorry to hear that you got COVID, uh, and I'm so sorry to hear that you had all of these problems with your blood clotting. These antiviral drugs, uh, Paxlovid, Monopiravir, uh, even the monoclonals, uh, all have uh, interactions with many, many other medications. The final judgment as to whether you need to stop or slow down or reduce the dose of other medications, or even whether you're a, a candidate for Paxlovid or any of the other uh, COVID drugs, is ultimately the decision of your physician. Because everybody's different, particularly when you're 89 and you're on multiple medications, some of those medications are more critical uh, to your health uh, than, uh, than a case of uh, COVID might be. But at 89, uh, COVID can certainly uh, result in severe, severe illness, let alone hospitalization. But let me uh, again uh, ask our ex expert here, Dr. Rupp, uh, about the, uh, the wisdom and the frequency of reducing or stopping uh, anticoagulants associated with, uh, with uh, Paxlovid administration. Dr. Gold, I think your advice is right on that uh, people really do need to be in contact with their healthcare professionals. These questions are fairly complex and have to do with uh, the various medicines that they're on and the various conditions. Uh, somebody who is at low risk of blood clotting could safely have their uh, anticoagulant stopped or cut back uh, for a few days while they're on Paxlovid. Other patients who might be at higher risk, you uh, might wanna shy away from Paxlovid and go with some of the other preventative medicines that you uh, have already pointed out. Uh, for folks who do have these conditions and are of increased age, obviously COVID-19 can be very treacherous and we want people to take advantage of the medications that are available to prevent the progression of disease. Uh, but this is something that you need to be in contact with your providers for. Uh, they'll help you uh, weigh those risks and make those choices. But we really appreciate you sharing your experience with us. Thank you so much for that call, Laverne. That leaves a line open for you tonight, 877-731-6733. What are your questions? Maybe like Laverne, you have a question that you need a doctor to answer. Something better than Google? That's what we're here for. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. We're going to take more of your calls on the other side of the break. But the show, our time together is running low. So make sure you get your call in. We still have time for it right now. We'll be right back with more Rural Health Matters after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and our special guest tonight, Dr. Mark Rupp, infectious disease expert with UNMC. We only have a few moments left. We still have time for your call, 877-731-6733. We'll go straight to the phones. Joe from Pennsylvania joins us now. Go right ahead, Joe. Joe? All right, we're going to Florida, where Ed joins the conversation tonight on our live broadcast. Thanks for joining us, Ed. Go right ahead with your question. Yeah, thank you, Christina. Uh, a question is for Dr. Gold, um, well, for both of you, you gentlemen. Uh, and that is, I've had both uh, both Pfizer vaccines and both boosters, and uh, but I have COPD also, and I'm wondering if I, I just want to know if there's a uh, another booster on the horizon here. Thank you. So, uh, Ed, uh, the the answer to the question is yes. There are several that are being developed. Uh, there may just be one very similar to what you previously received, but also there are several of the large manufacturers that are developing boosters that are Omicron specific, possibly even specific to BA5. And the unique thing about these, this new generation that are being developed is that they should have efficacy against multiple different strains. 
because the original vaccines uh, created immunity uh, based upon a single site of the virus that's known as the spike protein. That's the part that protrudes. That's the part that sticks to our cells that makes these viruses so transmissible. These newer vaccines have identified at least two sites, and several of them actually more than two sites, uh, that can be attacked on the virus. And so, theoretically, you're doubling or tripling your bet uh, on whether or not the vaccines will be effective against multiple current and future subtypes and variants uh, of the disease. So, yeah, I, it's great that you've had two boosts, uh, but, you know, I think as we get into the late summer, early fall, hopefully these new vaccines will be available. All right. Thank you so much for that call, Ed. We appreciate it. We're going to go to Louisiana next. Rose joins our conversation now. Thanks for joining us, Rose. Go right ahead. Okay, we seem to have lost Rose, which brings me to my next question for Dr. Rupp, because we, I finally get a chance to. We have so many calls tonight, we just keep them rolling in, and we're going to go back to the phones in just a moment. But Dr. Rupp, since we do have you here, I will ask you, at this moment in the pandemic, what is your number one concern? Well, I think, uh, you know, we already touched upon it a little bit that people are just uh, so fatigued about the pandemic. Uh, people are really letting down their guard. Uh, becoming too complacent. And I do think that uh, folks can take some fairly simple precautions and can really improve their safety. It's not an all or none kind of thing where either you're locked down or you're throwing caution to the wind. I think that people need to evaluate their risk and take uh, some precautions uh, that, that would make sense for them. And then as Dr. Gold pointed out, uh, you know, we're, we're lagging so far behind in getting uh, booster doses into the population of the United States. And I'm deeply concerned about that. I think that, um, you know, if you look at any other developed country in the world, uh, we're well behind the rest of the world. And uh, that's just a real shame. I think part of it is because things have become so politicized. Uh, there's so much misinformation out there. And it really is the best bet to keep yourself healthy, keep yourself out of the hospital or dying from COVID, is to get vaccinated and stay up to date with your boosters. And clearly, you are in the medical community, but I will ask you, just so that you can be our example to follow, how are you using your mask right now? When do you think it's appropriate? Well, Christina, you know, I, again, um, realize that uh, people need to, you know, maintain their contacts, maintain their family ties. Uh, these are, are deeply important, and nobody is talking about uh, folks isolating to the point where they don't have those very important human connections. But for me personally, uh, you know, I look at a situation, and if I'm going to go into uh, an indoor shared uh, setting, uh, where there's lots of people, I do the best I can to avoid that. Uh, if I can't avoid it, then I'm certainly going to wear a mask. And I think that, uh, you know, folks, particularly if they're at high risk, uh, should be taking those same sorts of precautions. Okay. Well, if you're like me, you probably don't like big crowds anyway. So it, it works out for someone like me. 877-731-6733 is the number to join our conversation. We're going to go back to the phones. Jim from Pennsylvania, I believe we have you back. Go right ahead, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, what uh, is the possibility of the monkeypox virus being transmitted from uh, pustular fluid through clothing? Yeah. So, you know, Jim, uh, we've seen that happen because this is uh, spread through the pustular eruptions of the rash. And so whether it's through clothing, whether it's through, you know, bathroom lavatory surfaces uh, uh, or even uh, human to human contact, of course, uh, that raises the possibility of spread of the virus. And it does appear that these are pretty hardy viruses. And what I mean by that is that they do tend to survive in clothing and on uh, outside surfaces a lot longer uh, than the SARS-CoV-2 virus does, the virus that causes uh, COVID-19. And so for all of those reasons, one needs to be extra careful uh, if there's somebody in your household or somebody that you know uh, has a monkeypox rash. Uh, there is good medication, by the way, to slow or blunt the progression of that. And as I said earlier, the vaccines seem to be quite effective uh, as well. Okay, Rob from Colorado joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Rob. Go right ahead. 
Hello. Uh, just had a question if the doctors had any evidence of... Th so my wife had some masses and we're right in the middle of inspecting them, a biopsy, a PET scan, a CAT scan. And, it, and at first, all things pointed to cancer scared the heck out of us, but now it seems like it's my, it might be sarcoidosis. And I wondered if they could speak a little bit on that and if they're seeing sarcoidosis, I, and I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, Maybe not. Mm -hmm. um, if if they're seeing that, because through all our doctor visits lately, I've heard healthcare workers say there's been a huge um, increase of cases that they're seeing here in Denver at several hospitals. We've been to we've been to mm -hmm. a few that there's masses and. You know, it's on her lymphoid system, lymphatic mm -hmm. system, and um, the first biopsy came back and said no malignancy detected, and and she doesn't look sickly, she doesn't feel sickly, but there's this condition called sarcoidosis, and I'm wondering if you guys can relate that to COVID. Now, Dr. Rupp, I think this one's for you. I mean, sarcoidosis is certainly a well-established disease. It is not a malignancy. But was there any association uh, with COVID or vaccine or, or anything that you're aware of that uh, Rob might be seeing in the Denver area? Yeah, again, thanks, Rob, for your question. Um, I, I'm not aware of any linkage between COVID-19 and uh, upswing in cases of sarcoid. Uh, sarcoidosis has been a disease that we've known about for decades. However, uh, we don't really know the etiology or the cause for sarcoidosis. Uh, there's certainly a wide spectrum in disease from things that are very mild and can be easily contained up to more serious disease. Uh, so again, uh, Rob, this is one where you're going to have to rely upon your uh, local experts there, your physicians and healthcare providers to help you guide uh, through this. But what a relief that you didn't have that report that it was malignant. So God bless you and your wife, and we wish you all the best in the future. Thank you so much for that call. We had so many great calls tonight. Doctors, I'd like to give you each an opportunity to share your final thoughts with us. Dr. Gold, let's start with you. Yeah, just to say, Christina, you know, I get asked all the time or very frequently at least what keeps me up at night about this. And one of the things that we haven't mentioned uh, is the incredible and ongoing impact on behavioral health. Uh, we not only have stressed our health care workers and caused a lot of anxiety and therefore reduced the workforce, but our communities, our patients, our school children are still feeling the stress and the anxiety associated with this pandemic. And we hear you and we know about that and we're doing our very best uh, to be responsive. But let's not forget that it's not just the temperature and the rash and the, and the vaccine, but it's our mental well-being that is so critical. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Dr. Gold. And Dr. Rupp, what are your final thoughts for us tonight? Well, Christina, um, infectious disease, there's just never a dull moment, is there? So uh, tonight's program, I think, has really borne that out with the questions about monkeypox, with the ongoing concern with COVID-19. As I've already related, uh, you know, I think that uh, people do need to continue to be cautious with COVID-19. Uh, their best bet is to get the vaccine and help protect themselves. And then to be aware of some of these other uh, diseases as they uh, spin out, yes. uh, to be aware and to, you know, uh, take uh, special precautions. All right, well, thank you both so much. I really appreciate the information that is only shared on this show. We'll see you next week, 5 p.m.